Good morning or good afternoon, everybody, depending on where you're, uh, where you're joining us from today. Thanks for being here for our webinar. We'll just give a few minutes for, uh, for some of our attendees to filter in. Sorry, we're starting just a couple minutes late here, but we'll give ourselves a few minutes and then we'll get started. Thanks for being here. And I think uh, in the interest of time, we can get started here. Uh, I think we've got just what everybody, I see perfect, Dr. Ford has just joined us. Thank you and welcome, <laughs> sir. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. Uh, if you're in British Columbia, good afternoon. If you're uh, just about anywhere else, thank you for being here today for uh, CGCN's webinar, Cluster Update for Crop Protection and Monitoring. My name is Ethan Churchill. I am the project manager for CGCN RCCV, and I'll also be serving as co-moderator for the webinar today, along with my colleague, Bill Armstrong, who is on our board of directors and a member of our knowledge and technology transfer committee as well. Uh, we're joined today by several wonderful guest speakers, and it's a bit of a, a British Columbia party today. Uh, we have Dr. Miranda Hart, Dr. Tom Ford, Dr. Deborah Henderson, and we'll be joined in a little bit by Dr. Tom Lowry as well. Uh, please know just a few little things before we get started here. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and we'll post it on our website and our social media platforms afterwards. If you either want to view it again or share it with a colleague who was not able to make it today. Um, also, I'd like to just point out briefly that the content of these presentations is the property of the researchers and the authors, and any use or distribution of this information can only be done uh, with their permission. Uh, a couple notes about the question and answer period as well. Uh, normally, if you've attended one of our previous webinars, you'd be familiar with this. We usually do a Q&A at the end of all the presentations, um, but Dr. Hart has other time commitments. There's a few convocations going on today. Um, so she's going to do her presentation first and then depart from the webinar. So after her presentation is concluded, um, if anyone has any questions about that one specifically, We'll make a little bit of time for a brief q a for her uh, before she has to to leave we'll still do the full q a at the end of all the presentations but we just wanted to make sure that uh, if anyone has any questions for dr hart that we can address them before she has to leave uh last other thing in terms of administration before we jump in here um for the the during the presentations for screen sharing purposes um as an attendee you can adjust the size of the screen being shared uh, and our camera pictures, if you'd like to, if you wanna make the presentation a little bigger, there's a, a double vertical line right in the split between the presentation screen and the camera. So you can adjust the presentation size as needed. Uh, before we jump into Dr. Hart's presentation, I just have a really quick introduction to go through a little bit about CGCN and the, uh, the Grape and Wine Science Cluster and talk about the theme of the presentations that we'll, uh, that we'll be seeing today. Uh, so just a bit here about the cluster overall, uh, the application for the agri-science cluster was submitted all the way back in January 2018. Uh, the cluster activities, of which there are 23, are built around past research in each province to create a, a national coordinated effort to address key challenges in the grape and wine sector. Our application was approved in May of that year for $8.4 million in federal funding through the Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada Canadian Agricultural Partnership 
uh, also included $3 million in industry funding over five years for those 23 research activities that I mentioned. Uh, we're currently in the last year of this program, which began as of April 1st. Uh, so we thought it was a really uh, important and pertinent thing to be hosting some cluster update webinars um, to see what, the, what progress has been made on all these activities through four years. Here is the list of the research activities broken down into their key themes. Uh, we have science coordination, which is the one that allows CGCN to administer the cluster. We have strategic management of grapevine virus diseases, cold hardiness and adaptation to climate change, sustainable management of soil, water, and crop quality, optimizing the quality of Canadian wines, and of course, the one we are here for to learn more about today, crop protection and monitoring. This theme focuses on exploring crop protection strategies for healthier fruit and a reduction in the use of pest control products. Obviously, these things have both environmental and economic implications, which I'm sure we will learn more about today. That's all I wanted to say about the cluster. I figured I should keep it short and sweet, save more time for, uh, for the presentations that we're going to be hearing today. If anyone has any questions, though, about uh, what we do as an organization or about the cluster, my contact info is there. Feel free to, uh, to reach out at any time. I'll stop sharing my screen here. Uh, and Miranda, if you want to go ahead and pull up your presentation slides, I'll uh, read your introduction here briefly. So Dr. Miranda Hart is a professor from the University of British Columbia, Okanagan. She studies soil microbial ecology and plant microbe interactions in viticultural systems. Her work focuses on how growers can manipulate soil biodiversity to improve vine performance and berry quality and lead to sustainable low input vineyards. Without further ado, I will uh, allow her to begin a presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Ethan. Can you guys see everything okay and hear me all right? Yep, we can hear you and the slides look good. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, hi, yes, yeah, so I'm here to talk to you about what I've been doing over the last four years or so. It's not a straight trajectory. I mean, there were, COVID threw a huge wrench into our plan, but when I was putting this together, I was so surprised at where we ended up. So I'm gonna tell you about what we did and where I wanna go with this because the overwhelming conclusion I came to making this presentation was, there are so many questions that we unearthed, but let's get started. Okay, so I'm gonna be presenting work from all of my students and I'll introduce you to them as we go through this. There. Okay, so this idea of using plants to mitigate disease is not new. I mean, humans have been doing this for literally millennia, right? Um, this is just an aerial shot of, I think it's over Saskatchewan, maybe not. I don't think Saskatchewan uses those circles, but anyhow, you get the idea, right? Farmers manipulate the composition of their crops in order to decrease um, pathogens that are specific to their crops. It's, it's, it's pretty basic. And the thing is, well, wine growers have a ton of diseases that are soil borne that could benefit from this because we have these long-lived perennials, right? We're planting long-lived perennials in the same soil over and over again. And this is a perfect storm for pathogens to, to show up, but it's also the perfect platform to manipulate soils because we have all this acreage where the vines don't exist, where we could put whatever we want. So my idea was how do we manipulate cover crop to to decrease pathogens in the soil. So what's the relationship between the soil microbes and the plants specifically in this case for this grant was to decrease a soil, um, soil borne pathogens, like the ones that are responsible for young vine decline and replant disease, which is a huge, huge problem for all growers. And there's a whole suite of complexes, disease complexes that um, are devastating for growers, but that I really believe can be treated through manipulating the soil microbes. So this was my overarching goal. I'm sorry, I don't even, I gotta keep my eye on the time. Um, and the theory is, if we can increase soil biodiversity, then we will increase soil health. And this is, this is well proven, right? There are, in the last 30 years, there have been so many studies that have showed if we increase soil biodiversity, we increase plant diversity, 
we increase carbon in the soil, we increase plant productivity, decomposition and nutrient cycling, um, we decrease N2O emissions, we decrease leaching, we decrease N leaching. I mean, it's all good. The more microbes we have in the soil, the better it is for the ecosystem. And this is just a, this just shows soil biodiversity is good for ecosystems. That is 100% known for sure. But how do we do that? How do we manipulate soil biodiversity? Um, and then that's where I came to cover crops with, in vineyards. We're so lucky that we have this canvas, this blank canvas to manipulate plants because plants, in my experience throughout my career, are the number one most effective tool for manipulating soil microbial communities. So if that's true, how do we do this? How do we choose which cover crops to use? And, and growers have so many things to think about when they're choosing cover crops, right? So I wanted to approach this from an ecological perspective and, and from a disease perspective, which ones should they use? Should they, should they plant diverse cover crops? Like I showed you, plant diversity, soil micro, some microbial diversity is really good for ecosystem services. Maybe if we just load up as many plants as we can into the yard, that'll be good for soil health. The alternative is, the flip side is, well, maybe we should pick plants that are specifically functional for the, for the trait we want, like biofumigants. Maybe we should just use biofumigants. Or if we're low in nitrogen, maybe we should just use legumes. Should we be choosing them strategically or should we just be using as many as we can? So these are the questions I set out to test in this um, last granting cycle. But I also wanted to look at, I forgot this, should we be using locally adapted cover crops, right? There's some research that shows locally adapted plants um, cultivate more beneficial microbial communities and there's less pathogens. So these are the three overarching ideas I wanted to address in my research. And let's keep going, why isn't it? Okay, but at the same time, it's tricky, right? Because we don't want plants that are gonna act as pathogen reservoirs, right? We don't want plants that are gonna be susceptible to the same diseases and just increase the abundance of, of the pathogens. And we don't wanna kill good microbes, right? So it, using biofumigants is great because they kill fungi, but they also kill the good fungi. So how can we strategically use these plants to kill the bad guys and keep the good guys? Okay, so the first place I started with this is diversity because I had this feeling that diversity was gonna be the most important thing, plant, increased plant diversity. And this was a study by my student, Andrew Richards, who is just starting his PhD at Davis now. Um, and what he did, he did a greenhouse experiment and he manipulated plant diversity in soil. So he grew different combinations of plant numbers from a, from a species pool. And then he grew grapevine in these soils and he inoculated them with Ilionectria. And we waited to see what the disease progression would be like. And this is, this is a graph from his paper. And it showed that by far um, the most necrosis and the most consistent necrosis was in plants, uh, vines that were grown in soil that didn't have any plants previously. Um, and, but among the plant diversity, there wasn't, there was no statistical difference, which shows obviously plants are really important for interacting or, or for indirectly um, manipulating soil microbes, right? So it's good to have plants, but in this case, it didn't seem to matter how many plants. And part of me, there's a couple of things that went on here. I don't think that our plant diversity treatments were high enough for plants, isn't that much. Um, so, the idea was to then scale this up and test this in the field. So I had a different student, um, Eric Bukasevich, who's now a professor in Connecticut. Um, he wanted to look at diversity, but also functional. So this was a very applied project. So he wasn't manipulating the numbers of species, but he was, he was taking commonly used cover crops and seeing how they affected soil microbes. So, he did this over a couple of seasons in, in um, Summerlin Research Center. And what did he, well, he found first of all that the cover crops had definitely affected vines differentially, right? So on the bottom here, we have cover crop treatments and um, F is fescue. So best, if you grew fescue under vines, you had much shorter uh, shoot length in your vines. Um, so 
fescue apparently wasn't good for them. Um, and also in terms of leaf water potential, legumes had much lower water potential in the vines if you grew um, legumes under the vines. Okay, so this, this research showed, yes, the, the plants affect vine performance, but how are they affecting vine performance? So his next study um, looked at the microbial communities, right? So we want to see how are these plants, where the plants are affecting the vines, how are they affecting the microbes in the soil? And so for this one, he had, um, he had treatment, sorry, I can't see my slides properly. Um, he, had, uh, he had groups of treatments, which were exotic grasses, exotic grasses and legumes, native grasses, native grasses and legumes. And he found, yes, definitely, these cover crop combinations, even though they're functionally very, very similar, they, they cultivated statistically different um, microbial communities. Okay, so this is, this is good. This is what we thought would happen. Um, and they also changed the amount of, of disease incidents in the vine that were growing with them. So you can see here in this case, um, above ground growth, exotic grasses had the, the highest growth response in the vines, whereas native grasses and forbs had the highest necrotic surface area. So this is kind of opposite what I had thought. And this is opposite of what the ecological literature says, where uh, locally adapted plants and soil communities should be most beneficial. Um, the difference is, we don't know if they're, maybe they are most beneficial for the native grasses and for, forbs, but they're not the most beneficial for the vines, which is the whole point of this exercise. Okay, so that the, we then we looked at, well, what are the consequences? These communities, microbial communities are different. They're affecting the vines differentially. How are they affecting if we go up the food chain? So what we did was we took these soils that had been cultivated um, by these different cover crop combinations and we uh, reared larvae in them. Um, and these larvae are uh, herbivores. So growers want to decrease the incidence of herbivores, obviously. And we found that the entomopathogenic fungi, the fungi that actually uh, attack and kill the larvae, um, this changed the, the amount of death by mycosis and the, the amount of um, entomopathogenic fungi change depending on the cover crops. So there's not just consequences for the microbes and the vines, there's, there's consequences for the entire food chain. Well, maybe not the entire one, but parts of the food chain. And again, these um, entomopathogenic fun fungal communities were different. They differed among ground cover types. And, but most importantly here is they differed by ground cover treatments. And here, the highest death rate was associated with native grasses and native grasses and forbs. So again, we see the signal of provenance. Where the plants are coming from is important. Who the functional attributes of the plants are important, but it seems it seems it's hard to predict which ones are going to be good for which traits, right? So some of the cover crops are good for promoting plant growth. Some of them are good for promoting um, entomopathogenic fungi. It's it's there's so many variables. It's hard to pin down one overall specific treatment that's the best. Okay, so here's where COVID came in. We were about to take our diversity study into the field and do manipulative diversity studies, which would require several years in the field. And we could, we got shut down. So to make up for that, we decided to do a shorter experiment. And I wanted to look at, okay, so if we take biofumigant cover crops, which are very popular, right? They, they, there's a lot of evidence that these guys work. What happens to the microbial communities, the good, one, the good ones and the bad ones, and also which biofumigants should we be using in the Okanagan? I mean, they're, they're different. The plants are very, very different. Um, they're not all the same, right? They have very different ecology. They have different biochemistry. So they, they produce different biofumigants. Now this was a pro that's not a picture of Corinne, by the way. Um, she was a master's student who, who did this project. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about her master's thesis. We've just submitted this for publication, so it's not, not been published yet. But um, so we took two natives and two exotics. So we took um, Shepherd's Purse, uh, oops, sorry, uh, Rockcress, which are um, 
well, Capsella is not native, but it is locally abundant and, and um, naturalized. So we had these two native-ish brassicas, and we also had very commercial brassicas that growers use like white mustard and tillage radish. Now, not only are they different in terms of the size of their body, but like, look at the tillage radish. They're, they're massive, these massive tubers. So you can imagine they're not all gonna have the same effect as biofumigants. And what we found was, depending on the, the, the plant we used, um, well, they, there was a significant difference in the soil, the fungal diversity. We only looked at the fungal diversity um, when we used biofumigants versus when we used um, nothing. When we just had, and nothing wasn't bare ground, nothing was um, just whatever the grower was using. So it was a pretty diverse community, but biofumigants did change the community. And in this case, it increased the diversity, which isn't what I thought. Now, there's many ways that they could have changed the diversity, and we, we need to dig deeper into this, but they could have, um, they could have killed off the competitive, um, most competitive fungus, right, and, and allowed the subordinates to proliferate. We don't, we don't know, but they did change fungal um, diversity. Where are we? Okay. Oh, why? Um, but interestingly, they changed, we, in this study, we looked at nematodes. Um, they changed the relative abundance of the nematodes. So in, when you were with rockcress, rockcress, Hobel's rockcress, you were more likely than not to encounter a plant parasitic nematode as opposed to a free living nematode. So rockcress, I guess, um, made it worse for your plants in terms of plant parasitic nematodes, at least in terms of the abundance of the nematodes. We didn't, we didn't look at how much damage they had done. Again, there's consequences up the food chain. Okay, so next step, I, I should probably be talking about too many studies, but uh, that's okay. The next step was to figure out, okay, well, these cover crops have differences on soil, on the plants, on the, on the organisms in the soil, which of these though are conserved as a, as a reservoir for the pathogen itself? So this was a study done by Andrew Richards and um, my PDF, Daniel Rosa, and collaborating with Mehdi Sharifi. Um, again, this we've just submitted this work, but what this was a greenhouse study and we took, you know, I think it was 20 something commonly used cover crops and we grew them with Ilionectria, um, Blackfoot disease to see you know, if they don't act as pathogen reservoirs, we shouldn't see blackfoot in the roots or the soil of these plants. Um, so it's a very simple experiment. And here's what we found. We found that all of these plants, this is root, this is the amount of Ilionectria, so the amount of pathogen in the roots of all of these cover crops. And so you can see that some of them had none, like this crescendo lindino clover, we couldn't find any. Um, sorry. And there were several plants that had a very low levels of pathogen. Now, the ones that I'm highlighting, these are indistinguishable from the amount we added to the pot. So it suggests that these plants are absolutely not hosts for the fungus whatsoever, because we could not find them in the roots. And when we looked at it in the soil, well, it's a little bit different. There's a lot more um, Ilion nectary in the soil. And you can see that, I don't know if you can see that blue line. That's the amount that we should be able to detect if we're still, if we're just detecting our inoculant. If we added our inoculant and it didn't grow and it just sat there in the soil, that's what we should have found. And we found significantly more than that in all of the soils. Um, Ilionectria can act as a saprobe. So likely, even if it couldn't get into the roots, because you know, in some of these plants, we couldn't find it in the roots, but we can find it in the soil. So it was probably had limited growth in the soil due to saprobic abilities, but some of the plants had really high levels of, of Ilionectria, suggesting that you don't want these, if Ilionectria is a problem in your soil, you don't want these plants because they will augment the populations in the soil, which could lead to more disease in your vineyard. Okay, so that, and some of them had relatively low. So you can start to see that this, this research is a little bit exasperating because every time we looked at a different function of cover crops, you know, different plants are important for different functions. And there doesn't seem to be this universal beneficial plant. Not, not that I thought that there was, but what, what are the take home messages? I guess I have to, in order to move forward, we have to somehow synthesize this. 
Well, number one, cover crops absolutely change soil microbial communities. And I look, focus mostly on fungal communities. This is 100% true, and it's a very quick change, and it's a significant change. These changes can affect pathogens in the soil, but they can also affect mutualists. So we have to be careful with their choice of crops. But there's not a clear signal yet, right? We don't, it's not necessarily the most diverse uh, cover crops. It's not necessarily the functional cover crops we want to choose. And it's not necessarily a particular phylogenetic group of plants that are superior, right? These legumes aren't more superior than the brassicas. It depends on what we're looking at, which I always hate saying that as an ecologist, but that's, that's kind of the truth. So where do we go from here? My goal, my goal as a researcher is to be able to say to growers, here's what you should plant between your vines or under your vines based on what your site conditions are like, based on the climate, based on what you're worried about, this is what you need to plant. Can't do that yet. Um, we need to understand, these were all very short-term studies, right? We need to do this over longer-term studies, um, over more soil types, over more climates. I just need more information. And we also need to look at how site-specific management practices affect these, right? I mean, differences in fertigation, in irrigation, in tillage, all of these things are going to significantly affect what is happening below ground and above ground. And so the next, the next granting cycle, I'm hoping to look at integrating plant, soil, and management to see overall what is creating the healthiest soil. And I hate using that word, but healthiest in a multifunctional sense, not just for disease, not just for carbon soil storage, not just for nutrients, but overall, what are the best insurance policies you can plant using, using plants? Um, I hope that wasn't too much. I wanna thank all of my collaborators, um, this, the vineyards, particularly Tantalus, where most of this work happened. Um, and all of my students and all my collaborators. I have a ton of collaborators at Summerlin that I could do none of this work without, um, particularly Tom Forge and Jose Urbas Torres and Pat Bowen have all been so, so, and, and Mehdi Sharifi have been so important. So thank you to them and thank you to my students. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Miranda. There was a, a lot to cover there on the uh, not intended, but yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much. That was awesome. Uh, if any of our attendees have questions for Dr. Hart, um, you've got a couple of minutes now. If you want to just type them into the Q&A section uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen there, and we can address those. Um, if not, I'm thinking as well, because I know, uh, Miranda, you don't have much time left with us here. Uh, if anybody has questions, uh, for Dr. Harden, they don't have the time to, to be answered right now. Um, perhaps maybe they can be emailed to me and I'll, I'll pass them along um, to you if, if you're all right with that. If somebody has a question. That Absolutely. You, right can, now. you can email me directly too. That's that's totally fine. I'm happy to answer anything. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure that your contact information is, is made available um, probably on our website along with the webinar video if that's all right. So people can uh, can ask questions once the video is uh, made available as well. So, uh, perfect, yeah, not seeing anything for now. Um, so I don't wanna keep it too long. I know you've got to run to a few convocation right. ceremonies, but- Thanks. Um, oh, sorry, just one quick question actually has come up here. Oh um, yeah, looking at other, uh, consider looking at other young vine decline pathogens. Um, yes, short answer, yes, always. Um, it's, it's just, layers of complexity, right? I guess I've been focusing on Ilionectria because we have such great tools to measure. Um, Crown gall is, is, is the obvious next step because I do have good tools to measure that. So, and that is part of the next granting cycle, looking at Crown gall. The problem with looking at disease is we have to make sure we have really good molecular tools to be able to identify and track these microbes, um, especially with disease complexes, right? That are multiple agents, it, they're hard they're hard to measure so right now we're sticking with the the diseases that are really well um, delineated in terms of their molecular tools which are ilionectria and crown gall so yes crown gall is coming don't worry um, any effects on mycorrhizas um, we didn't we looked a little all we looked at was mycorrhizal abundance spores which is a really poor way of measuring mycorrhizal response because a lot of 
mycorrhizal fungi don't even sporulate. Um, there wasn't there wasn't an effect on the spores. Surprisingly, the biofumigants did not affect the um, abundance of the spores. But these vineyards, this took place at Tantalus, and Tantalus has probably the most robust cover cropping system I've ever seen in my life. It's so diverse. There's so much productivity that the fungi in the soil probably, if they weren't getting anything from the fumigants in the um, vine rows, were associating with plants in the um, drive rows. So, right, that's that's why I'm saying these these site specific consequences are really profound. I think that the brassicas might have a bigger effect if if somebody's using um, tillage or Roundup or they they have a low abundant cover crop in their drive rows that would really affect who the fungi are able to, to connect with. So again, more context specific things to think about. Perfect, all right, thank you very much for answering those questions there. Um, I'll let you go ahead and you can stop sharing your screen and then uh, I'll let you depart, but thank you so much for, uh, for taking the time to be with us today, I appreciate it. And I've got a busy schedule as does uh, everyone who's joining us as a, as a guest presenter today, but yeah, thank you so much for being here and enjoy all of the uh, the convocation ceremonies you've got coming today. I'll just uh, give her a moment there. Perfect. All right. Uh, okay, Dr. Tom Forge, if you are uh, ready and willing, I'll let you turn your camera on, get your uh, your presentation all set up, and I will provide your introduction here to our audience. Let me just pull up the proper screen here. Just as a reminder as well for all of our attendees, um, we'll do the rest of the Q&A at the end of all the presentations. Um, so if you have any questions for the remaining three speakers here, um, feel free to just type them into that Q&A section on your Zoom screen and then we will address them all um, at once at the end of the session. Tom, are you uh, are you with us? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I did share a screen, but then I forgot to turn my screen on. <laughs> <laughs> no problem um, at all. I'll let you uh, yeah. I'll let you get set up here, and I'll uh, introduce you yeah. briefly to the crowd. So, can you guys see my screen now? No, I don't see it. Okay. Let's go back here. I have to hit share screen again. Okay, seeing anything? Uh, not yet. Um, it's funny, okay. we practiced this the other day and now it's, uh, I know, it's giving us I know. difficulties, right? Go figure. Um, okay, I'll hit share screen again. Share. There we go, okay. Okay, okay. All righty, I'll, uh, yeah, I'll let you get prepped to your slides there and I'll just read a little bit about you for everybody. Sure. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's all good. It's all good. Dr. Tom Forge is an applied soil ecologist with Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in British Columbia. He specializes in research on the ecology and management of plant parasitic nematodes affecting horticultural crops. From 2001 to 2013, Tom was located at the Agassiz Research and Development Center, where his research was focused primarily on berry crops. Since 2013, Tom has been located at the Summerland Research and Development Center, where his research has been focused primarily on tree fruit and wine grape production. Prior to joining AAFC, Tom was an independent researcher consultant in the Okanagan Valley for five years. And before that, he conducted postdoctoral research at Oregon State University, the Pacific Forestry Center in Victoria, BC, and the Macaulay Land Use Research Institute in Scotland. Without further ado, I will leave it to you, sir. Thanks, Ethan, and uh, thanks in general to uh, to you and uh, the CGCN folks uh, for arranging these opportunities for us to to share our research with everybody online, virtually. Uh, it, it's a great opportunity. So, um, so mostly what I'm going to talk about, and it'll be structured around, is the specific objectives of uh, the research we've been doing as part of the CGCN cluster over the past four years, uh, four and a half years now, I guess. And uh, however, I will 
at, at times I'll, I'll delve into some previous research that we did just to provide context uh, for some of the work uh, that we've done in the last uh, few years. And, uh, but also I'll, I'll just start with some basic information about plant parasitic nematodes, again, just to help set the context for our work. So plant parasitic nematodes are of course, uh, translucent microscopic roundworms, very small. Um, the plant parasites, there's lots of different kinds of, of uh, nematodes dwelling in soil. The plant parasites have these characteristic stylets or piercing sucking mouth parts. You can see here in this particular one. And so they, you know, at a, at a smaller scale than aphids, but they kind of function like aphids uh, in the soil. And they use those uh, stylets to puncture uh, the epidermis and, and cell walls of, of very fine roots. And that's how they do their damage. And there are endo, endoparasites and ectoparasites and, and all sorts of life styles in between. Um, another point I want to make about plant parasitic nematodes is that they exist along with other types of nematodes, uh, omnivores, predators, bacterial feeders, and fungal feeders, along with a myriad other invertebrates uh, helping to comprise the, the soil food web. And so a handful of soil, about 100 cubic centimeters or half a cup, uh, roughly, you know, is uh, a typical vineyard soil is going to yield about 500 to 1,000 nematodes total with varying proportions of those being plant parasites, depending on, on the, the situation in the particular soil. Globally, plant parasitic nematodes are really well recognized as pests in some of the more mature, I'd call them mature or older, uh, warm Mediterranean climate production regions of the world, such as California, France, Spain, Italy, et cetera. Um, and, and we know from you know, literally 100 years of, of people studying nematodes in these types of vineyard contexts, that uh, problems develop very gradually. These, uh, the populations are very slow to build up once they're established. Uh, they're also cryptic and easily overlooked so that even in new vineyards and young production regions, uh, they're often not, you know, not really detected uh, in the early stages. And also, uh, just so you know, if you, if you ever get into the literature uh, kind of globally um, uh, on plant parasitic nematodes, Probably the most prevalent ones that you see reference to in terms of vineyard uh, situations are root knot nematodes, Meloidogyne species, dagger nematodes or Xiphonema species, root lesion or Pratolinca species, and then citrus is, is one we don't have around here, um, and uh, <laughs> as you might imagine. And then kind of last, but we're going to have a lot more focus on it, is ring nematode, Mesocrichonema xenoplax. Um, so I referred to the cryptic nature of plant parasitic nematodes. And so what we mean by that is that there are no real distinctive signs or symptoms of the damage that they cause uh, to grapevines. And once a you know, significant infestation is, is established, usually it's simply observed as, as patchy poor growth. In some cases, entire vineyards will be kind of evenly uh, infested. And it, it's hard to discern the patchiness uh, as kind of a, a telltale thing. Uh, because it's, it's all relative, right? It's, it's uh, subtle differences in, in vine vigor. And so soil sampling and actual analyses for the nematode populations is absolutely critical uh, for uh, detecting uh, nematode issues. Uh, as I mentioned before, populations build up over years and even decades, uh, and the impacts are cumulative. Uh, you know, with a woody perennial, as you might imagine, uh, impacts of feeding in this year will then influence uh, you know, formation of buds and, and, and even uh, the and storage of carbohydrates, et cetera, and even the, the ability of the plants then to push the next spring. And then if there's a you know, subtle effect on, on vigor through that year, then there's a further kind of, you know, uh, uh, decline in, in vigor. And so for this reason, and as we all know, in, in all vineyards, all sorts of things start to happen to vines as they get older and as you get these cumulative effects. And so it's really difficult sometimes to disentangle uh, the influences of nematodes from other factors such as viruses and trunk diseases, et cetera. Um, population densities also often co-vary with soil properties. Some taxa of nematodes prefer, or you might say they build up to higher population densities in sandier soils uh, than, than in uh, more fine textured soils. And so often it's, it's difficult to separate those effects in terms of what's causing patchy poor growth. And, because of this intimate association with, you know, other aspects of soil quality and uh, water availability, nutrient availability, et cetera, plant parasitic nematodes, and, and because they're biological entities, <laughs> they're really integral to the concept of, of soil health, which is a much broader concept, but it's hard to be serious about 
asking uh, questions about the quote the health of vineyard soils without uh, including uh, or having a kind of a particular focus on plant parasitic nematodes. So, um, so we started our, pro our project with a survey, uh, basically, of the Okanagan. And so prior to 2018, our understanding of plant parasitic nematodes, the distribution of plant parasitic nematodes in the Okanagan was really based on ad hoc samples that had come in over the years uh, to my own laboratory, to the BC Ministry uh, Plant Health Lab, and to the BC Tree Fruits uh, uh, Cooperative Lab that they had running. And so we, we knew kind of what groups of nematodes to expect, but we didn't really have a full appreciation of their distribution uh, among vineyards. And we had from that earlier uh, sampling, we knew we had suspicions about uh, the group of nematodes called ring nematodes. And uh, based on some research that had been done down in Oregon, we you know, were, were interested in, in following up uh, or targeting work on them a little bit more. And so uh, we initiated the survey in 2018. We, we sampled 57 blocks in, in 2018. The sites were chosen to, to um, system systematically best represent the soil type classes uh, and, and regions. Uh, so we didn't just simply go out to where people were anticipating nematode issues. We, we sat down and used GIS to uh, and, and mapping of, of soil classes to choose soil classes among vineyards and, and regions. And we we picked our sampling sites accordingly. And so we were able to link our uh, information on nematodes to soil properties as well. And the important thing here is we used a different uh, extraction method for the nematodes that is uh, specifically um, much, much better for, for uh, capturing ring nematodes than the extraction methods have been used in almost all previous survey types of work in the Okanagan, but also then is used uh, by uh, most commercial labs, at least those in, in Canada. And so just to really quickly jump to the, the results of, of that first uh, survey, um, the ring nematode population, uh, ring nem so this, this table, uh, going the columns going across are the major groups of nematodes. So this isn't broken down by species here. This is just by the genus and the kind of the common name groups that we refer to. And the most frequently found one, so this first row is percentage of the, of the vineyards that were positive, 82% of the vineyards had ring nematodes in them. Not at all, not all of them with large population dens densities, but a very high proportion of the vineyards had them. Likewise, lesion nematodes were very uh, frequently found as, and dagger nematodes as well. Root knot, pin, and stubby root uh, were uh, much less uh, frequently found. So we, we immediately kind of had an interest, this piqued our interest in, in these particular groups of nematodes for kind of orienting uh, the, the next steps of, of our work. Another important thing to point out is so often we, we do this kind of work and it's important to realize that 88% of the sites had two or more groups of these nematodes, 53% of the sites had three or more groups of nematodes. And so, you know, we can talk about what we know about the effect of this species or that species but to take it to the next level and to understand in a complex environment like a vineyard, what are the cumulative effects of two or three different species of nematodes on uh, vineyards is, is, is really a, a difficult challenge. And so quickly, I, I want to also point out before I go back to kind of focusing on our Okanagan based work, but uh, we had the, the great fortune of being able to connect with uh, Deb Moreau and Harrison Wright uh, in Kentville Research and Development Center our Ag Canada colleagues there to also uh, take part in a survey for nematodes in Nova Scotia. And so they organized all, all the sampling and, and identification of the blocks and sent uh, the, took the soil samples and sent them to our lab uh, for analyses. And very quickly, I just want to highlight that ring nematodes, so I've set this table up very similarly to before, but the uh, frequency of occurrence of ring nematodes was actually fairly similar to what we found in British Columbia. Dagger nematodes were a little bit less frequently found, but certainly uh, substantial. Lesion nematodes were, were very, were kind of similarly uh, frequently found as well. Um, also, when we got down, down and dirty with our uh, species level identifications, in Nova Scotia, we confirmed that the, the one species of ring, ring nematode that is most prevalent in vineyards worldwide and is known to be the most damaging was confirmed to be there, but we also found other species there. In fact, the, the sites with the most abundant ring nematode populations had a different species that uh, we know nothing about at this point other than that it's a different species. 
So uh, back to our interest in, in following up in more detail with the ring nematode. So as I indicated, it's much more widespread and abundant uh, than we originally expected. Uh, these nematodes are well-known pests of grapevine and prunus species fruit trees worldwide. So this has implications for our cherry industry in BC as well. And it was likely overlooked in earlier surveys because of the extraction methods that were used. Um, as I indicated, we, we, we kind of had a, a heads up that this nematode would be of interest. And so as part of our earlier work funded under the BC Wine Grape uh, Council DIAP study, so 2007 through 12, if I recall correctly, we set up what's called a, a field microplot experiment where we had these large 100 liter capacity pots installed in trenches uh, out in a field. Then we backfilled the pots and fumigated all of them uh, with a granular fumigant. Then we planted uh, a selection of, of rootstocks. rootstocks. Uh, we had 3309, 10114, SO4, and riparia uh, in the experimental design as well as self-rooted Merlot. Then half, half, of each, half of the pots of each rootstock were inoculated with, with ring nematodes. We, were, we grew them out for four years. And this is an example of some of the data that uh, we got. So this is trunk cross-sectional area for the self-rooted and for 3309C. And we see that those that were growing in pots with the ring nematodes had significantly low, smaller diameters. And, and this is the same case for 3309C. The effects weren't quite as dramatic for the other rootstocks, but they were in the same direction. Um, all rootstocks were labeled as susceptible insofar as the nematode populations propagated or they grew, uh, multiplied uh, quite substantially on all of the rootstocks, but not all the rootstocks were the same in terms of how the, the degree of impact that the nematode had on them. So, um, so we already, kind of had a pretty good idea. And, and this, this work that we did is, is consistent with more extensive microplot type work that was done with by colleagues of mine down in Oregon uh, in the early 2000s. So I'm going to shift uh, and just quickly talk uh, briefly about some of the other nematodes of, of interest uh, that we got through this survey work. So dagger nematodes, uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of those, uh, very uh, long, graceful nematodes with long stylets. Um, Zip, uh, the ones that we have uh, that we have found are all belong to what's called the Ziphonema americanum group of species. Uh, once upon a time, it was all just named one species, and what we found was actually consistent with an er with an earlier survey done in British Columbia in 1987, in which around 85% of, of vineyards sampled at that time had uh, nematodes in this group, and they did morpho morphology based identifications. And most of the populations were identified as, as Zipnema bricolens, which is actually named for British Columbia, if you look at that species name. Um, and, and it was actually part of the first uh, description of that particular species. Um, these nematodes are widespread on woody perennials in North America. There's about 20 different species within this group of species. They're vectors of Nipah viruses, uh, including tomato ring spot virus, tobacco ring spot, cherry rasp leaf, et cetera. Um, the direct effects of, of this nematode uh, in the absence of virus are totally unknown at this point in time. Um, grape Nipah viruses are one of the main reasons we're concerned about dagger nematodes. There's just a, a quick pictorial of uh, the damage that can be caused by tomato ring spot virus. Tomato ring spot virus is very rare, if almost non-existent in, in British Columbia, uh, you know, due to past uh, phytoprotection uh, efforts. Uh, but it, it does occur in the Pacific Northwest. These photos are from uh, a vineyard in Oregon uh, by my colleague Inga Zasada, uh, just to indicate, you know, and, and the picture on the right is from a planting that was previously heavily infested with tomato ring spot virus. It has lots of dagger nematodes, and there was no control effort on the nematodes done between replanting and you have very poor early growth, loss of vigor. Part of the reason I wanted to drill down a little bit more about dagger nematodes is because uh, grapevine fan leaf virus uh, is a major concern to the industry because uh, it's a very damaging virus and it is vectored by dagger nematode. And it's really important to, to emphasize that it's in this case though, that one particular virus seems to have a very specific relationship with one particular species of dagger nematode called Ziphonema index. And, and I can say emphatically, we've never observed it in British Columbia, and there's never been a report of it in Canada uh, to this date. 
And so I just want to kind of highlight that so everybody is aware that although we have lots of ring, lots of dagger nematodes, uh, very high frequency of occurrence, um, we do not tend to have very many NEPO viruses to begin with. And even if we were to get grapevine family virus, it's not a major concern because that specific vector is not present. Lesion nematodes were high, were high frequency, frequently found. Uh, and so um, uh, in, the Californ in California, in the Mediterranean regions, it's a species known as Pratolinchus vulnus. And in British Columbia, we have, we have not found uh, Pratolinchus vulnus uh, to date. Um, and almost all, all of our species level identifications have led to either Pratolinchus penetrans or Pratolinchus neglectus. Greenhouse experiments we did as part of uh, this project um, and through 2019 and 2020, in collaboration with my colleague Inga Zasada in Oregon, we did parallel experiments. Uh, she using her populations, I using our populations. Uh, we demonstrated uh, conclusively that neither Pratolingus penetrans nor Pratolingus neglectus parasitize uh, grapevines. So in a way, this is um, you know, not all that exciting. We all look for positive results. But it's actually really important information because now when people get uh, the results from nematode assays that have been done at commercial labs or what have you, you know, you don't have to puzzle over, well, what is, what is the importance of you know, these counts of Pratolinchus nematodes? Because we do not have species of Pratolinchus in British Columbia that are problems on grapes. So you can almost rule those out. But at the same time, we remain vigilant for uh, uh, Pratolinchus vulnus. Root knot nematodes globally, the most damaging species are Meloidogyne incognita and Meloidogyne arenaria. And I just want to point out a very similar situation with lesion nematodes than in Canada. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> in Canada, only Meloidogyne hapla, which it's known as the northern root knot nematode, has been observed in vineyards to date, is generally less pathogenic than those other species. And very recently, my again, my good colleague Inga. Uh, published a paper in 2019 demonstrating that most of the commonly used rootstocks are relatively resistant to Meloidogon hapla. So again, we can kind of, we didn't know this at the time when we started the project, but this kind of helps us to rule out or at least uh, put root knot nematodes and root lesion nematodes lower on the priority list of things to work on as we move forward. Now, why is my, there we go. Okay, so now it's a, a few quick words about the ecology of plant parasitic nematodes. And some of this work, uh, again, we've been doing under uh, the current cluster project. Some earlier work in the left-hand panel there, earlier work indicated that ring nematodes that, that we did here at the research center, early work indicated that ring nematodes did respond to irrigation inputs. And so that graph there, the dotted line is for low frequency irrigation in which we waited at least three days uh, between uh, irrigation events. And uh, the uh, solid line is um, uh, daily irrigation, but these both received the same amount of total irrigation and just how it was distributed. And you see that the much higher population densities of the ring nematode with the more frequent irrigation. Uh, and also there was an increase with uh, nitrogen application rate. So we wanted to kind of follow up on this and then to uh, further understand the relationship of these ring nematodes with, with irrigation and, and soil water. And so we had an opportunity to work with Pat and Carl uh, as they were setting up an experiment under this cluster to use infrared sensor-based canopy temperatures to schedule irrigation uh, in, in blocks. And, um, and, and so we, we commenced a sampling in 2018, sampled through 2019. The study was interrupted in 2020 uh, due to COVID, and then eventually also to the impending retirement of, of both Pat and Carl. And we're just now resuming this study with uh, uh, Dr. Ben Min Chang, who's, who's, who's joined the Summerlin Research Center. And so I just, preliminary data, we did start by the end of 2019, we did start to see some differential responses of the ring nematode populations to these different irrigation treatments. So we're really anxious to kind of get back out there with Ben to follow up on this and, and, and finish this out. And so I'm not gonna go too much further into, in, into interpreting uh, these results at this point, other than to point out that we were seeing uh, changes in the nematode populations based on the different irrigation practices. Uh, so similarly, we have ongoing work uh, with uh, uh, collaborators on the role that ring nematodes play uh, in other diseases. 
Uh, first and foremost, we're working with uh, Tanya Bogle, Louise Nelson, and graduate student Portia McGonigal uh, up at UBC Okanagan on the effects of comp, and this is a field-based project, the effects of compost am amendments on the incidence of crown gall, nematode populations, and their interactions. Um, and just speaking to the nematode population uh, part of it, the study, si the study site was relatively young when we started. It had just been planted in 2014. It was a horse pasture before that. And so we had very, very low populations of plant parasitic nematodes to begin with. And this is one of the difficulties in, in doing field-based collaborative work. Sometimes you choose a site for one purpose and may not necessarily be the best site for other purposes. But it's been really interesting to see as we've gotten into the project that dagger nematode populations at least are starting to build up in those plots. And we're starting to see some differentiation among the compost treatments, as you can see from these, these colored lines. And these are statistically significant differences, but I. Uh, again, it's it's in progress, and and I, I want to look for some more data uh, or see how the trend continues before we kind of get too crazy about interpreting specific differences between composts. Um, um, and then likewise, on the trunk disease side of things, uh, Jose uh, Urbas Torres and graduate student, PhD student Jared Rykan are doing really uh, comprehensive work on all the various factors that can influence the expression of, of trunk diseases. And, and as part of that, uh, they are including uh, ring, ring nematodes as po possible uh, factors uh, in, in some of their experiments. And, and I just want to make a shout out to the work that they're doing. They've got greenhouse as well as field microplot experiments ongoing in which ring nematodes have been included uh, in these experiments. And I will not say any more about that because I know Jared is, is uh, he's still working on, his, on uh, analyzing data from a uh, big greenhouse experiment, et cetera. And so, I'll leave it to the graduate students to report in, in due time. Um, so nematodes, emerging questions and, and some thoughts about next steps. So dagger nematodes, uh, you know, we, we didn't dive in as much as we have with ring nematodes to this point, but definitely I think we need to do some more work on sort of re reassessing and confirming the species identifications of populations we have in BC. Again, I kind of realized that that earlier work uh, had taken it, I'd taken it for granted, but it was all based on morphology. 1987 was when it was done. Uh, and so a lot of things could have changed. We need to know something about the effects of uh, Ziphonema bricolensis on grapevine physiology. If these nematodes are out there in 80 some percent of our vineyards, uh, I think we need, to, we need to learn more about them. Um, we need to learn more about the synergistic effects of multiple species in vineyards. Uh, and one of the big ones, I think, is we need to evaluate uh, nematode-resistant rootstocks. The previous work that had been done on ring nematodes, including our own microplot experiment, as I mentioned, as well as work that had been done in Oregon, was all on the currently existing sort of commonly used rootstocks. And basically, none of them are actually resistant to ring nematodes in particular. But in 2012, uh, UC Davis um, released uh, five new rootstocks that are labeled as nematode resistant. So this is quite new from a rootstock development perspective. Those rootstocks were all previously evaluated against Meloidogyne species found in California, Ziphonema index, not populations we have up here, uh, and populations, uh, California populations of Mesocrichinema, which we've come to learn more recently, uh, geographically distinct populations can differ in their aggressiveness on different rootstocks. So we need to assess, I, I think it, it behooves us to assess uh, these, the resistance of these rootstocks uh, to BC populations of ring nematodes as well as dagger nematodes under BC conditions. Uh, and, uh, and I think that'd be important kind of baseline work if we are anticipating more nematode issues as the industry matures in British Columbia. Um, then also, um, I, I'm trying to continue in uh, exploring the influences of ground cover and cover crop management uh, and relationships of nematode populations with soil health. This wasn't really talked about as part of this particular project, but it, it's a general theme of, of research we're doing. Uh, and I'm working in collaboration with Mehdi Sharifi and Dave Ensing uh, in, in our own research center, as well as Miranda, as, as mentioned earlier. Um, and then, uh, of course, uh, we're trying to continue working on the interrelationships of nematode populations with irrig irrigation practices and buying water relations. So with that, I hopefully haven't taken too much time, but I just want to say 
major thanks to all the people who have, who have helped and, and, and especially the funding from the CGCN cluster and earlier the BC Wine Grape uh, Die Out project. A uh, special shout out to Paige Monroe and Sean uh, Kushta, technicians. Sean is no longer in, in, in our lab, but uh, technicians in the early stages who are just phenomenal in, in doing all this. They do all the work and uh, external collaborators, and especially Inga Zasada, you know, not a formal part of the project, but uh, has been an incredible uh, uh, collaborator through the years. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks. Perfect, John. Thank you so much. Not too much time, just the uh, just the perfect amount of time for sure. That was great. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. If anyone has any questions uh, for Dr. Forge, as I mentioned, we'll do the remaining Q and A uh, at the end of the the remaining presentations here. But feel free to put them uh, either in the the Q and A section or uh, in the chat we've been using today as well. Um, so yeah, Tom, I'll let you go ahead and okay. uh, turn the screen share off. And there we go. Uh, I think. Up next on our list is Dr. Henderson. So if you want to go ahead and uh, turn your camera on and uh, share the screen, we can get started. And I will introduce you to the group as well. All righty. Dr. Deborah Henderson has been the director of the Institute for Sustainable Horticulture, or ISH, at Kwantlen Polytechnic University in Surrey, BC since 2005. She received her PhD from UBC in 1982 and established ES Crop Consult Limited in 1989 to offer IPM and research services to both conventional and organic agriculture in the Fraser Valley. Deborah developed an active research program in biological and non-chemical management strategies for pests and diseases to advance agriculture and landscapes towards ecologically sound alternatives. Her research at ISH develops microbial biocontrols and environmentally sound bioproducts in partnership with agricultural industry partners. Her goal is to put more biocontrol options into the hands of growers. I will leave it to you, Deborah. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Ethan, and thank you for inviting me. Um, everything's okay. You can see my screen and I can't see you. And so yeah, it all looks good. It's yeah. good. <laughs> so the objectives of activity 16B, we had it's a three-year project. We established first year colonies of two cutworm species and um, assess commercially available nematodes. Because our objective, our overall objective for this was to combine some, a couple of IPM strategies for cutworm control. So year two, we did some combining with Bovaria bassiana, our most promising um, fungal um, entomopath uh, entomopathogen. And, and results from year one, our best uh, nematode species in vitro, and we intended to do it in potted plants. And then also looking at the best combination of biocontrols with temperatures for each species. And then we were, we were planning in, in year three, and we had a little bit of a detour, but um, to put the po populations of cutworms on potted grape, grape plants in pots. But our overall objective was to develop a biologically based IPM strategy for cutworm on wine grapes, register new biological tools for growers, and share the results with industry. So the two uh, pests, of course, um, or groups of pests, Abagrotis orbis. Um, Abagrotis is, is a complex and there are many of them. They're native in the, the dry regions at low elevation in the Okanagan. And adults fly late summer and early, early autumn and lay eggs near the ground. Uh, we believe larvae feed on low vegetation, but they have some preferences and they'll overwinter as small larvae. And at some point they'll go into the soil in the fall. And in spring, they emerge, feed on early weeds, and then climb onto the grapevines to feed on the buds. They have a very broad host range. The other, which is Eurasian in origin, it was introduced in 1982, and it's moving east. Um, Noctua comes is, um, adults also fly sort of mid to late summer and early autumn. The larvae are generalist feeders and have many hosts, just like Abagrotus in both urban and agricultural environments. And I've seen quite a lot of them actually in Vancouver where I live. Um, it hasn't yet written to outbreak status. Uh, it has a cousin, a Noctua pronuba who has, um, and it has similar life history to Abagrotis orbis, which makes it a little bit convenient for um, developing uh, biocontrol strategy. So a little background to this project. Um, we started this work in 2016 when Tom Lowry and associates 
um, transferred to us, the colonies of Abagrotus orbis and Noctua comes, um, and two strains of Bovaria bassiana, one of them lovingly known as cutworm killer. It has a very long other name. And the other one, which um, has a T at the end of its name, and I, I'm just assuming that means cutworm killer too. Uh, so we in 2016 and to 18 compared the efficacy of those isolates against cutworm and, and some other lepidopteran species in the lab and in, in some potted trials uh, on the coast. And we also compared mass production with five isolates, the two from the Okanagan and uh, three from the coast, and all passed that test, but one of the Okanagan ones was a better producer than the other, and it's the cutworm killer two that was a little bit of a better producer. So we all seem very, we are very focused on like cool temperatures, and both of the Okanagan isolates were selected because they um, perform better at cooler temperatures. So 15 is kind of our target temperature for most of our trials. And, and this explains why the pest exists in the spring and also the larvae exist in the fall. And that's when the temperatures two to 16 or 14 to 21 in the fall. And then um, below the top 10 centimeters of soil, bare soil, of course not covered soil, is very similar to air temperature, but below 10 centimeters, it's more influenced by moisture. So whatever the air temperature is, the soil temperature is probably fairly similar, maybe a little bit warmer, a little bit more moderated if there's a cover crop. And what this means is that when we have that larva in the spring and it's coming out of the soil and um, feeding on the vines, it is 15 is a, a pretty standard temperature to expect it to be operating at. And similarly in the fall, when those tiny larvae are still feeding on weeds before they go into the soil, they are experiencing the same temperatures. So we are looking for biocontrols that can operate at those temperatures. Um, during the summer, we've got um, pupating larvae, and then we have adults who emerge, possibly not too emerges a little earlier than albigrotus. Um, and there is a, a not to, there are a number of not to a pheromones that we are going to hopefully try this year because we've applied for another grant. Um, and the eggs are gonna be present also at a fairly warm time of the year. And then the larvae, it's still fairly warm. So other, lots of bios are very, very effective at warm temperatures, but not so at cooler temperatures. So if we can focus some of our, our strategy on those times when we have eggs and small larvae, and maybe time the adults, figure out when the adults are flying and when they're laying eggs, um, it might actually contribute a lot to the strategy of biocontrol. There's my pointers to show you. Oh yeah, and that's that that little bag there. That means that's one's costing you money. And these are the targets. So when when we apply Bovaria bassiana, it is a, a fungus that attacks through the cuticle. So the the larva does not have to eat um, any leaf material that it's on. It just has to come in contact with it. So we call that residual toxicity. So when we apply it to a leaf disc, as you see the little picture there, and then put a larva on it. Um, just that larvae walking around or moving around should expose it to um, the pathogen, the entomopathogen. So we, we came up with a, a typical kind of concentration, applied it to leaf discs and put them in cups with larvae and checked them daily for mortality. And it, all the trials that I'm showing you were repeated three times. And we did it with um, the two it looks like we just did it with one in this trial, which is with one of the um, isolates from the Okanagan, the cutworm killer one, and three of the isolates from the coast and one tropical one because I really wanted to see something that didn't work and um, a commercial isolate, which happens to be Botanigard. And this was at 15 degrees against uh, Noctua comes larvae. And we had this cluster of four that um, did much better than the, uh, than the rest of them. Of course, the control did not, there was no mortality. And the tropical one was a little bit sad, but one of our um, coastal ones was also a little bit sad. But among the, the top group, we had two coastal isolates, cutworm killer and, uh, and actually um, Botanigard. Turns out it's not so bad at 15 degrees. And then we did a lot of other things, and this is very complicated, I'm sorry, but I put some little red circles around the ones that I think are most interesting. There were, we looked at the mortality at three different temperatures across the bottom. And then we also looked in the second, we also looked at sporulation. 
And when, when a fungus sporulates on the outside of an insect, it grows on the inside, kills the insects, and then it grows outside of the insect and produces spores. Oh, we think that that's a, an indication that the fungus is pretty happy with the food source. And when it releases more spores to the environment, it's also cycling that um, entomopathogen. But again, we had for um, Abagrodes orbis, we had four equally effective strains at 15. And one of them was the commercial one. So the second um, biocontrol we looked at were the entomopathic nematodes. And they um, actually attack the insect through the um, holes, like through the mouth or the anus or um, um, spiracle holes in, in the cuticle. They get inside, they release a bacteria, which turns that larval body into a good food source and more bacteria for the um, nematodes and they reproduce. And then when they fill up the space, they burst out and, and more nematodes go into the environment to find more insects. So again, they're not eaten. They just have to find that larva and then find a way in. And there are several doors. So there are three commercial species with different host seeking strategies. One is Heteroraptitis bacteriophora. And we use that one for European chafer control in turf in BC, and also vine weevils and ornamentals. And it's, it's characteristic. It's an active seeking predator. It moves a lot around in the soil. And it's recommended, especially for sedentary pests. So like black vine weevil is pretty, pretty still in the soil. It doesn't move very far from where it's feeding. So this, this particular nematode is very effective at finding it. But it doesn't have any development below 12 degrees or above 30. And its most effective temperature is 20. So not maybe our most um, hopeful uh, isolate or species. But there are two others. There's Steinernema carpocapsi, which is used extensively in cranberries for cranberry girdler control, which is a lepidopteran, and its, and its larva is in the soil. It's a very moving, fast moving larva in the soil. And the strategy of Steinernema carpocapsi is to ambush its prey. So it sits still and it just waits for something to come by. And when it just detects a movement, it attacks and it's pretty effective for fast moving lepidoptera. But again, no development be below 12 degrees or above 30 and most effective at fairly warm temperatures. Our final commercial species, Steinernema feltii, is normally used to control dipteran larvae and thrips. Um, it's a little intermediate in its activity. It doesn't sit still and it doesn't move as fast as the other one, but it's got a little bit more, more mobility and, and host seeking behavior. Um, it's a little bit more cold active, uh, no development before 10 or above 30. However, it maintains its infectivity as low as 10 degrees. So there are two ways to use nematodes. One, well, you can use them on as a foliary, a foliar application. They don't live too long if you do that, but you can put them in the soil and they will live for up to three weeks in the soil without a host. So that's usually the way they're used um, in my experience in IPM programs. But the temperatures that we're talking about happen in the fall and in the spring and larvae are small. So at the point where those cutworm larvae are going into the soil, if the soil temperature is, is warm enough, we may get some fairly good control at that point, reducing the larvae who are going to emerge out of the soil in the spring. In the spring, we could potentially apply, I think the soil is gonna to be too cold, but we could apply to the foliage, um, either on the early weeds or on the vines when the larvae start to climb. Uh, and usually an adjuvant is used, like a summer oil when that, when that, when that use is, when that application method is used. Um, but you may not prevent the damage because still things are gonna be fairly slow at 15 degrees. And while that uh, cutworm larva is feeding, it may be infected, but it might take a few days for it to stop feeding. So we wanted to look at the rates that we would have to use at different temperatures with all those different species. And we put them in cups on filter paper with various rates, three different temperatures, 15 reps per instar, and of course, different instars. And I'm not going to show you all that data, but here's the summary. Um, Abogardus orbis uh, for the, the smaller, the second instar larvae, which would be probably the ones going into the soil in the fall, could potentially be the ones also emerging early in the spring. Uh, Steiner Nema carpocapsi was, was the uh, nematode of choice at 15 degrees. At 20 degrees, everything worked. Um, well, two of them worked. And when they got to be a bit larger, um, Steinernema feltii also worked just as well as Carpocapsi. 
and it also continued to work at the higher temperatures. Uh, Noctua comes, the second instar, very much uh, Steiner nemophiltii was more effective and continued to be more effective for the larger larvae. But at that point, um, Bacteriophora also was somewhat effective at 15, but that was the only time it was. And so we decided to pretty much drop it from our trials at that point. So Feltii was effective even at half label rates at 15 for uh, Noctua comes. And Carpocapsi was as effective as Feltii against the small larvae of Abagrotus orbis um, at, at higher rates. But as the nematode rates decreased, Feltii was the more effective species. So we decided to go with Feltii for our, our subsequent trials. And it did give us some confidence that Feltii could work in the field. So next we put everything in soil and um, in cups again, we started in cups and we did the same thing all over again, different rates uh, diff and just used two temperatures, 15 and 20 and recorded mortality daily for 15 days. And what we found was again, um, Feltii was, was a very, very effective nematode. Now the number of nematodes per centimeter squared at 75, that's the rate that's, that's recommended on the label for soil dwelling pests for these nematodes in particular for things like vine weevil. So 25 was below the, late, the label rate and six was extremely low. Uh, but we wanted to see the range because when we started to combine the, the nematodes with the fungus, we will probably hopefully, hopefully be able to use a lower rate. So we did a total of 11 trials. Um, COVID knocked out our, our larger Abagrotus orbis trials because they were all set up and ready to go. And then we had to leave the lab for about a month and we just lost them. But it looked like we were getting very similar results to what we got without the soil that we had good, Feltii was really good all around and confirmed to us that we could continue to put it in our trials. So we graduated it on to our combination trials and we use the two low rates of the nematodes, the six juveniles, infective juveniles, which is the infective stage that you get in the commercial products, and 25, which again is below the label rate, applied to the soil, and we only used Feltii. And then we used Bassi, uh, Bovaria bassiana at one rate, and we just compared two of the isolates in, this, in these trials on broccoli leaf discs. So we, again, we sprayed those leaf discs so that they could be um, contact uh, as the larvae walked over them or moved over them, they'd just be in contact, but they were sitting on top of soil where the nematodes were. So they had the ability to go into the soil or come up to the leaf. And we used both of the cutworms. And at 15 degrees, we, had, we got a lot of interesting <laughs> results um, and, and probably some anomalies because the larvae couldn't go very far in the cups and they had to be exposed to one or the other. But at 15 degrees, we saw some additive and also some synergistic interaction. So when it's additive, you, if you get 30% death with one, 30% with the other, you would expect 60 as an additive effect. But if you got 80% effect death, then that would be synergistic. So you're getting more than the sum of the parts. Um, so, and we saw that um, the lowest rate of the nematodes, we were actually getting more uh, synergistic effects. So we kept using that through our trials. And then we also discovered that the one week interval between uh, exposing them to the Bovaria bassiana uh, after the nematodes was probably our best interval. And we kept using that. And we did many, many, many of these trials. And you'll see this is just an example of the, um, the two, well, the one, the cutworm killer two, uh, which is the Okanagan isolate. And then the ish one, which is 252 was the one we compared it to. And when we observed our, our results, we, we called them either additive or synergistic. And then occasionally we actually got antagonistic. So we got something lower than we would have expected um, had we got you know, just one plus the other. So why could that happen? Um, well, why could that happen? Because inside the body of the insect, there are two pathogens uh, competing for resources. So that may or may not happen in the field. Uh, again, this was a very closed environment and very close quarters for the nematodes and the, and the pathogen and the host. So then we wanted to move on to our potted trials um, using, we were still gonna use the two low rates 
And, but the lower rate was what we wanted to use initially to see those interactions in the cups and hoping that we might use a lower rate than the label rate in the field. And our intention was to progress to potted wine grape trials and we actually grew wine grapes. However, the larvae just didn't appreciate being closed in mesh bags and they, they just said no. And so we had to abandon that um, and try something else. Tom Lowry sent us some draba seeds because we know that's very attractive to at least Orbis, although it's toxic, uh, but they failed to germinate. So we said, okay, well, what other weeds are out there in the spring? Probably dandelion. And we, we looked at um, dandelion and shepherd's purse. So this is the slide that should have been before the last slide, but at, uh, when antagonism occurs, it's because there's a finite food resource within the insect's body. And we doubt that we'd see it as significantly in the field because there's more space for the larvae to move around. So these were the two that we, we grew in our greenhouse. And we looked at comes, um, Noctua comes, second in stars and fed them leaf discs. And they just simply grew more on dandelion. So the blue line is dandelion and that's over time, days of the assay and how much they, they increased in size. So we decided we would use dandelions as our potted plant um, trial. So we put the, again, those two isolates that we used in the combined trials, um, two, two uh, or oh, actually we used three. We used botanogard, we used um, a coastal isolate, isolate, and we used one of the Okanagan isolates. We used Feltii just at one rate, um, one week after the exposure to um, the fungus. And we used 10 larvae per plant. The dandelions were four inches tall, five replicates plants per treatment. And we in included a horticultural oil to keep the nematodes alive a little bit longer on the plants. And we did third instar of Orbis and second instar of Noctua comes. And our results were actually pretty similar to the potted trials, in the, in, in the cup trials rather, except that we didn't see any antagonism. So occasionally we saw synerg synergism and, some, and most often we saw additive effects. So what to, you, what to do with these, this, these results in a, a biological control program, an IPM strategy? In my experience, one biological tool alone is rarely effective because chemicals are just much stronger. Two is better, and if you have three biological tools, that's the best, and it gives you options, it gives you backup plans, and builds resilience into the system. The combination of cultural, cultural and biological tools to different life stages gives the most resilient pest management strategy. And, and, and it's, it's a subtle point, but managing a pest population is different from managing its damage. Typically, chemicals manage damage. They just reduce the numbers that are causing the damage. But a good IPM program has the potential to manage the whole population, to actually reduce the population for next year. So what, what we're proposing for um, an IPM strategy for climbing cutworm based on, on biological tools, and this, this represents a season. We have summer on the left and, and fall, winter and spring and what the pest is doing, the pests are doing above that in the blue bar, and then what some of our strategies would be um, coming up. And, and if we have time, I can talk about our next project, which we're just, we should hear about the funding any time now, but there are, there are some pheromones available and one of our industry partners is prepared to develop or prepared actually to create some, for research purposes, Abagrodi's pheromone traps pheromone lures that we can then time the flight and the emergence of the two species of cutworm or the Abagrodis complex at least and the Noctua uh, comes, maybe other Noctua as well. And then when the eggs are present, when the adults are laying eggs, when they're present and we know they're laying eggs, looking for where are those eggs? If they're on the ground, there are some trico trichogramma, they're little egg parasitoids commercially available that um, are, do very, very good job on egg masses. Some of them even do a fairly good job on single eggs if they're laid singly, uh, but they have to be able to search on the ground. So that's something we need to know. We don't know. We know one that searches in cranberry, which is on the ground, but in cranberry, there's nothing growing higher than cranberry. So they may choose to go up if there's a choice. Uh, we don't know, that's, that's, that's the research. And then when there are small larvae present, 
if they're feeding on the weeds, we may be able to apply Bovaria bassiana to the weeds. We may be able to apply foliar nematodes to the weeds. And then that other picture in there, which just looks like a gray blob, is a baculovirus. And it's, um, we've done a little bit of preliminary work with the baculovirus, and we have an industry partner that has a number of others that we would like to try. But if you can give um, a larva, a little lepidopteran larva, a virus just before it's going into soil to overwinter, it's almost like getting a cold and it just breaks it down, breaks down its immune system a little bit more and makes it a little more susceptible to any other stresses that might happen over the winter, like cold or maybe an infection with a nematode or bovaria. And then in the spring, all of those measures um, hopefully will reduce what's coming out of the soil. Um, and then I know that you probably already know about using some of the native um, brassicas like Draba to help uh, manage those pests when they're on the feeding on the ground because of the toxicity of the glycosinolates in them, in the um, brassica pests or brassica weeds. And then when you steam them, I think there's probably a difference between steaming the weeds and using a herbicide. If you steam them, that heat may also damage the larvae that you're trying to control. So there might be, and then again, that's a point of research. We don't really know for sure. But there's also a possibility of applying again the fungus at that stage if the temperature is warm enough. So thank you all. And I have to acknowledge we've had a great deal of funding from all of, of our, you know, the Canadian wine, wine grape certification, grape wine certification network more recently with, with the AAFC um, funding and We've also had in the past great wine grape council funding, investment agriculture, I think we've had investment agriculture, NSERC funding, and uh, thank you to all our current and past students and staff at our lab, and to Tom Lowry for sending us the isolates, and Township 7 provided all our grape cuttings for the, the grapes that we grew in hope that the larvae would like to eat them. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks so much, Deborah. That was wonderful, very informative. Nice to see too some uh, some information about a project that has already been completed. Most of the projects we've been hearing about so far in all of our cluster update webinars have uh, are are still ongoing. So it's nice to see at least a project um, from from the CGCN perspective, one that's already wrapped up. Although certainly still lots of research to uh, to be done. Um, so I'll I'll let Dr. Tom Lowry now uh, pull up his camera and pull up his slides, and that's our our fourth and final presentation for us here today. Um, sorry, Deborah, I think you'll just have to stop sharing your screen first to allow Tom. It doesn't say it. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. Sharing is, oh, it's paused. Stop share, got it. There you go, perfect, thank you so much. All right. Same uh, as for all our other presentations. If anyone has any questions for Dr. Henderson, uh, please type them into the, uh, the Q&A or the, the chat box there and we'll address them uh, once Dr. Lowry's presentation is wrapped up. But I'll just introduce him here briefly and then let him dive right in. Graduate of the University of Guelph and UBC, Dr. Tom Lowry has nearly 25 years of research experience at the Summerland Research and Development Center on sustainable grape pest management, including chemical and biological controls, leafhopper antifeedants, and the use of beneficial vineyard ground cover vegetation. He's also conducted research on the epidemiology and management of insect-borne plant diseases, including work with grapevine viruses and their vectors since 2011. Tom serves as an affiliate with Brock University's Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute, or Covey, and is an associate professor with UBC Okanagan in Kelowna. He served for many years on a number of BC Wine Grape Council research and development committees and produced the insect and mite chapter of the BC production guide for grapes and accompanying photo guides for grapevine pests and beneficial insects. Tom, thanks so much for being here and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ethan, and thank you to the CGCN for uh, uh, inviting us to present the uh, some of the results of our um, uh, project. Can you hear me okay, Ethan? Can you just verify that you can see everything and hear me okay? Yeah, you sound great and the presentation is full screen looking good. Great, thank you very much. 
So uh, I'm talking today about Project 17 Update Sustainable Management of Leaf Hoppers. And uh, we have a number of participants in this project. So I just wanted to uh, start off with acknowledging them and their technical assistance. Of course, we have a number of students as well, but there's the cast of characters from various parts of the country. <clears throat> I'm starting off with uh, sustainable management of leafhopper pests of grapes, starting off with an overview, I'll give you a bit of background on, on why this work is important. So leafhoppers cause considerable economic damage to grapes across the country, and there's increasing concern due to the growth in the organic and sustainable sectors and lack of effective controls under these uh, production systems. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, there are regional differences in leafhopper species and management practices and uh, possibility for development of insecticide resistance to some of the currently used uh, materials. I just wanted to point out this picture down uh, below here. Uh, this is from 20, from last year, 2021, during the extreme heat. Uh, we had uh, anyone producing grapes in the Okanagan can tell you it was a terrible year. They uh, organic growers ran out of uh, pyganic to control the leaf hoppers. So you can see here all of this scorching. Uh, they they a lot of crop was lost, and that damage is going to carry through to stress plants. I wouldn't be surprised if yields are way down again this year for these grapes. So activity 17 includes uh, biocontrol of leaf hoppers by anagris egg parasitoids, evaluation of feeding deterrents, insecticide efficacy trials, timing of control measures, et cetera. There's a number of uh, uh, projects in this uh, objective. However, I'm going to focus most of the attention on objective one, identification of anagris egg parasitoids and their leafhopper hosts, mainly because uh, the largest number of uh, participants are active in this objective. And uh, so this year, what I decided to do was focus on that. I asked each of the participants to provide some slides. So, they have done that and I'm going to do my best to sort of stitch them together and come up with something uh, that's coherent for uh, the viewers. So objective one, identification of anagris egg parasitoids and their leafhopper hosts. So anagris egg parasitoids are the most important natural control agents of leafhoppers. And they have been successfully used in classical biological control programs. For example, for the control of apple leaf hoppers in Australia. So there are several objectives within this. Uh, determine the anagris parasitoids of leaf hopper pests of grapes in Ontario. Uh, no work has previously been done in Ontario on anagris, and there's uh, on, there are a number of pest species there, so it was important to look at that. We want to identify alternate anagris summer and winter leafhopper hosts. And I'll just point out here that the uh, anagris that go after the leafhopper pests on grapes, they depend on other leafhoppers as winter hosts. So the, those leafhoppers that overwinter the egg stage, they utilize their hosts for the winter. And they also use other leafhopper hosts as early sort of uh, springboards. Uh, some of those eggs are laid earlier than, than are the eggs that are laid on grapes. So the, the leafhoppers outside of the cropping system are also very important. Uh, we want to explain why there are pockets in the Okanagan with very low numbers of Virginia creeper leafhopper and uh, a, a high rates of parasitism. We wanted to explain this. So is this due to the arrival of a new anagris species such as anagris tretiacove that occurs uh, naturally in the east? Or is it some other combination, perhaps a new uh, leafhopper or uh, maybe people are planting different plant hosts uh, for the existing ones. So are there plant species that could be planted in or around vineyards to enhance parasitism? So starting off with the situation with the pest populations of uh, leafhoppers. So we have a number of them shown here on the 
left side, these two species occur in the Okanagan, Virginia creeper leafhopper and the Western grape leafhopper. In addition to the Virginia creeper leafhopper, um, whoops, sorry. In addition to the uh, Virginia creeper leafhopper on the top left, in Ontario, they also have uh, at least half a dozen other species shown here on the right, plus the uh, um, evil narata on the bottom left here. So there's a number of species. And as I mentioned, uh, no work has been done previously on the leafhopper uh, anagris associations in Ontario. So we're interested in the pests, but as I mentioned, we're also interested in the non-pest leafhoppers because of their uh, importance as alternate hosts. So building a team to solve this problem, we were fortunate to have Dr. Joel Kitts from Ottawa involved in this, and he's the taxonomic expert for the uh, leafhopper group or for leafhoppers that we're interested in, so the cicadelids. Uh, so he's involved in helping with the identification of alternative anagris hosts. He's supporting efforts to determine the leafhopper hosts of the anagris species. He's identified 163 leafhopper specimens reared from possible winter host plants. And he's generated a total of 368 DNA barcodes from identified museum specimens to aid molecular identification of leafhoppers. So this is very important to uh, have an expert who can tell us uh, which leafhopper species we're dealing with. Of course, we also need an anagris expert and we're fortunate to have Dr. Sergei Triapitsin at UC uh, University of California, Riverside. He's a North American expert on the taxonomy of anagris wasps. So I uh, actually did some work with uh, uh, Dr. Tria Pitson uh, back starting in 2004. We have a publication in the Journal of Entoc BC in 2007. So we have a pretty good idea on some of the host, uh, the host anagris associations in the Okanagan. So he's uh, made uh, identifications that are very important. He also supplies some slide mount material but most importantly, he's providing material that goes into the molecular work I'm going to mention in a minute. But I just want to mention here that uh, shown in the picture down below, these uh, anagris are extremely tiny. So telling them apart when you're dealing with uh, micro hairs on wings and trying to determine the species, it's not difficult. And Sergey would be the first to tell you that it really uh, benefits from molecular work uh, coupled with the taxonomic work. And that's where we get into the work of uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Tara Garapi in London. So she's a molecular expert on um, identification of uh, parasitoids in particular, but uh, she's involved in the identification of host parasitoid associations in uh, leafhoppers and a molecular approach. So her objectives determine the composition of the anagris parasitoid species as associated with the leafhoppers, clearly delineate host parasitoid associations in these systems. So for first steps, she utilized the universal DNA barcode primers uh, they were not very effective at, at providing high quality DNA barcodes for the anagris and the cicadelids. So to address this, she developed more specific anagris uh, specific barcode primers, as well as specific cicadelid barcode primers that amplify leafhoppers without amplifying the anagris. Um, so this was very important. So this approach takes advantage of the diagnostic utility of the DNA barcode region while still allowing separation of DNA from the host and parasitoid in mixed samples, such as from parasitoid, parasitized leafhopper eggs. So a diagram, a diagram here, DNA barcode primers. So uh, Tara has done a great job uh, developing these primer sets so you can very accurately identify uh, or separate out the cicadelid uh, primer uh, sequences from the anagris sequences. So cicadelid DNA barcode uh, database that she's developed 
190 specimens have been analyzed, resulting in 166 barcode sequences and very good success, 87% success for the anagra species, 973 specimens as production of 777 barcode sequences with 80% success. And I'll have to mention that uh, that success rate uh, is uh, quite incredible considering these are uh, tiny little insects, the anagris, and they're being shipped, they're being collected in one part of the country, uh, preserved, sometimes not properly, and then shipped in some cases to Sergei and then back to um, back to Terra. So it's uh, those results are very good. So what are the results of all this work? Uh, results are a very accurate identification of the anagra species. So the expertly identified specimens provided by Dr. Sergei Triapitsin were barcoded by Dr. Garapi and were then used to identify larger numbers of field collected specimens by matching the barcodes. So she's determined from this work, five anagra species, anagris atomus, anagris danii, these are two that are very important in BC for the control of the two different uh, leafhopper pests. And then uh, some other uh, an unidentified anagris that uh, further work required on those, as well as anagris incarnatus and uh, bacon, uh, bacon dorfi. So these are more occasional finds. So what's the next steps uh, for the molecular tools? The, so send specimens of the unidentified anagris to uh, uh, Dr. Tria Pitson for morphological identification, hoping to assign a species name to the barcodes. And I will mention that along the way, we have found a couple of new species, apparently new species of anagris. So he might not have a common name to put with these barcodes. Um, also hoping to associate the anagra species to the host plant material for which they emerged to determine trends in host plant parasitoid associations and develop an assay to detect and identify anagras from leafhopper eggs. And this is uh, underway right now in order to investigate host parasitoid associations. So the benefit of this system, you can take uh, parasitized eggs. These are parasitized here. Uh, fortunately, easy to tell apart. If they're parasitized, you get two red eyes looking up at you. Sometimes, eventually, you'll see these fat bodies. If they're not parasitized, you'll get one red eye uh, looking up at you, and you won't have the fat bodies. These are ones parasitized. Uh, they're developed further along in their development, but you'll be able to uh, identify the host, uh, the host egg and the anagris associated with it at the same time. So it's one thing to do that work, but you have to go out, uh, spend a lot of time actually collecting the materials. So this is happening in three different regions. Dr. Uh, Paul Abram is working on the coast of BC. Uh, first of all, just to find out what uh, about the leafhoppers on grapes, but also um, uh, looking at non-crops as well. So determine the parasitoid complex of leafhopper eggs on grapes and on non-crop host plants that grow in the periphery of vineyards and throughout the landscape and determine whether there may be al alternative plant and leafhopper hosts for anagra species that are, that are attacking leafhoppers on grapes. So he's done a lot of work on the coast over a, a three-year period. So he surveyed vineyards on the coast of BC. And uh, fortunate for the growers down there, he was unable to find any leafhoppers infesting the grapes. There is no confirmed leafhopper damage either. So the only thing he found was a few that had just blown in temporary, uh, temporarily, perhaps not even feeding on the grapes. And, and I should mention, there were no insecticide applications on any of the uh, vineyards he was working in. So um, they were also absent from wild grapes as well. So confirmation over a number of years, there isn't a leafhopper problem on grapes on the coast. The Western grape and Virginia creeper leafhoppers may be absent or below detectable levels in coastal BC due to climatic factors, uh, geographic barriers, or other unknown biotic factors, such as pathogens or natural enemies. 
So looking at the non-crop anagrass surveys in coastal BC, he was uh, successful finding, uh, collecting a number of leafhopper species from non-crop plants. There was evidence of leafhopper reproduction, mostly on plants in the rosaceae family, such as wild and cultivated blackberries, uh, nine bark, et cetera. Uh, of these, rose leafhopper and bramble leafhopper were the dominant leafhopper species. I uh, did collect anagris from several host plant species in the family Rosaceae, and those dominant uh, species were anagris atomus and also a few specimens, a Bacchendorphi. Uh, So in Ontario, Dr. Uh, Justin Rankema has been collecting anagris and leaf hoppers from grape uh, leaf material. Uh, leaves were collected from three organic vineyards in the Niagara region, uh, 2018 to 2021, and also from some wild grapes in Virginia creeper vine. And as for all uh, collections, uh, the trick is you put these uh, collected material, either dormant material or uh, leaf uh, material of grapes in under a bucket or some other container where you have a, an opening with a glass vial where you can collect them. So he's been collecting the anagris and other insects in these glass vials, and they're sent for morphological and molecular ID. And again, parasitized eggs on leaves can be excised and sent to uh, Dr. Garapi's lab for host parasitoid molecular identification. And you can see the difference here. Uh, here's a, here's eggs, uh, not very visible, but you can see the outline here. These are not parasitized. They're fairly early in their development, no red eye stage yet. And here's some parasitized ones here. So again, you can excise these parasitized ones and send them for molecular uh, diagnostics. So he did also look at seasonality of anagris emergence from leaf material. And you can see more parasitoids from site three than sites one and two in both years. Peak emergence in August in 2020 and in September in 2021. And it's quite interesting the differences you can get from these are uh, all organic sites but tremendous difference in the amount of parasitoids that you're getting collecting at the different sites. So we also did some work in on, here in BC in the Okanagan in, the, in our lab. Now, uh, again, a slightly different collection system. We tend to use uh, well, a number of different uh, extraction containers, but we really like the, uh, basically it's a sewer pipe that we fasten vials onto. And I hope you can see it. There's a whole bunch of little dots here. Those are all anagris. Uh, so there's a whole pile of them in here. There's probably, I don't know, 50 of them in here. And so we have done a lot of work on alternate hosts as well as the uh, relationship to our pest leafhopper species. Turns out there's a separate uh, anagris uh, parasitoid attacking the, the two separate species of leafhoppers. So what we were looking for, we wanted to see if anagris tradia cove had appeared in the Okanagan. And part of this is to explain these areas where we have uh, exceedingly low populations of the Virginia creeper leafhopper. And are these low populations, are they associated with, uh, and we did show they were associated with high rates of parasitism by A. danii, anagris danii, early in the season. And there, there's a possible association with the presence of plants in the rosaceae plant family and prunus species in particular. So we've been doing a lot of mapping and, and collections to try to figure out. We'd love to know why the uh, populations of Virginia creeper leafhopper are so low in these areas that maybe we can use that, apply that elsewhere. So here's just a schematic just to quickly show it. It is complex. You really need a team to do this work. And fortunately, we have all the experts for the anagris identification, the leafhopper identification, the molecular diagnostic work, and then people in the field uh, collecting and recording all the, the vital information. So there's been a lot of work done and a lot of progress uh, made in on uh, this objective. So I've used most of my time up on the objective one, but I want to quickly run through 
uh, uh, some of the other work we're doing. So in our lab, we've been doing a lot of work on leafhopper feeding and oviposition deterrence. We've had great success with this. 24-hour uh, lab feeding choice test bioassays with leafhopper nymphs to evaluate the deterrent effects of various fungicides, surfactants, plant essential oils, formulated plant essential oils, and various other vineyard products. And we use a very simple system, uh, self-sealing uh, small petri dishes with holes in the bottom. We put in these grids uh, from cut from screen, and we can lay discs out with two of them treated with our test materials and two controls come back in 24 hours, uh, we put second instar nymphs because they're the right size and uh, it's the target age that we'd use. So what we found over the years that several organosilicone surfactants and strobal urine fungicides are highly deterrent to Virginia creeper leafhopper nymphs. I'll just show you one uh, a newer one we've done during this project. This is widespread max, one of the uh, uh, organosilicone surfactants. And at the one times rate, you can see here, only five of them were found after 24 hours on the treated discs uh, versus 122. And this effect, even when we diluted by 50% all the way down, you could see it at quite a dilute rate. So uh, we've uh, identified a number of materials that are uh, effective deterrents. We've done a lot more work that I'm not going to go into, except to say that we've done some trials, quite a few trials in the field, it, uh, the fortunately, the work we're doing in the lab translates very nicely to the field. You can see trials where the materials were put on August 4th and coming in much later, the nymph populations uh, were dramatically decreased from the control. You can see here with the, the fungicide pristine, the, the uh, almost a 98% a reduction. There are very few were left. And this is quite some time after the application. So they persist and they're quite effective, but you do require good leaf coverage as for oils. So if you don't get the coverage, you're not gonna get a very good effect. So we need uh, to do additional work on this and someone needs to explain what's going on exactly because it turns out it doesn't prevent overposition. It doesn't deter the adults. Uh, so you get, the same trap, same number of adults, collect the same number of eggs, but it's the nymphs that it's affecting. So it sees, seems to be a feeding deterrent against the nymphs, which is a little bit unusual. I wanted to quickly talk about some of the screening we're doing to test. Uh, we need some new chemical controls that are more sustainable. And so we've uh, evaluated in lab, uh, uh, lab efficacy trials, a number of materials. We've included uh, the standard, current standard organic uh, material, Pyganic, the world's uh, orga uh, organic uh, OMRI material, uh, Azadractin, and then a number of new materials that are either registered in the States for use on grape uh, against leafhoppers, such as uh, uh, Centaur uh, Buprofezin, and then a number of new materials. And what I've done here, instead of giving you actual results, because we're not finished with the stats yet, I've just coded them with uh, red indicating greater than 90% effectiveness Pyganic, Molt X, and Bexar. Uh, Tolfan Pyrad is the active, a product from Nachino, a 21A group, and it was very, very effective. Uh, the blue highlighted ones, greater than 65% effectiveness. So the Centaur, and we know this from work in the US, it's not super effective, except it's compatible with IPM. So it's com more compatible with the, um, the anagrus parasitoids that I mentioned. It does not kill them if they get to a certain stage. So it, this is, uh, buprofezin is an insect growth regulator uh, from Nichino, and it's an OMRI approved one as well. So we'd like to get that one, uh, look into that one a little bit more. Uh, Rycar, uh, Nichino 9B product uh, was fairly effective, but uh, beyond that, we have tested a number of other products. We still have XRL, 
to do the active cyantranilaprol, cy which is cyazapir is another name for it. And so we pretty well wrap that up. And I just wanted to quickly mention that we're also doing some field-based spray trials in collaboration with uh, Dave Neal's lab. So we're doing a lot of the insecticide screening. Another thing we added in because it became obvious, particularly with uh, oil sprays, that growers were having difficult time uh, accurately timing their spray applications. So we started, and part of this too was a response to the COVID shutdown when we couldn't go visit uh, growers to do some of the work. We started, expanded some of the work we were doing on uh, at our station. So we're monitoring leafhopper seasonal development. So we're out there frequently uh, collecting leaves, looking at leafhopper development, and relating that to vine physiology. So we're looking at the vine growth stages and also uh, have temperature recording uh, data recorders out in the vineyard. So we're coming up with models based on temperature, vine phenology. We're also looking at the uh, possibility of some plant indicators perhaps flowering weeds or plants that uh, growers really, I've done that before with cabbage maggot. Growers love it if you can just tell them uh, in the case of cabbage maggot, when the common vi uh, uh, lilac is blooming, go out and spray for your uh, cabbage maggot, it works well. So we're, we've done a lot of work on that as well. So in summary, in spite of COVID restrictions and the extreme heat experienced in the Okanagan in 2021, we've made significant progress toward completion of the objectives outlined in uh, Objective 17. Molecular diagnostic methods have been improved with the design of specific primers that are being used to help identify important leafhopper parasitoid relationships in Ontario and BC. Additional materials highly deterrent to leafhopper nymphs have been identified from lab choice test bioassays and lab trials have assessed the efficacy of several new insecticides. Plant phenology and temperature models are being developed to assist with the timing of control measures uh, such as leaf removal and insecticide applications. And I won't touch on any of the other parts of this project, but I will close with acknowledging funding provided by FC and CGCN and uh, appreciate the support from uh, support staff at uh, the research centers, uh, technicians and students. We really appreciate that. Special thanks to BC and Ontario wine industry members for their support and collaboration. So thank you very much. Wonderful, Tom. Thank you very much for uh, updating us on the presentation. I know all of these, this presentation included, were uh, highly anticipated. So I'm glad that we got to have everybody here today. Um, I'll ask all of our other uh, guest speakers here to turn their cameras back on. We uh, have a few minutes for, for Q&A. My colleague, Bill Armstrong, is here to, uh, to moderate if any questions come through. I didn't see any come up. Uh, during the final presentations there. But if any of our uh, attendees who are with us have any questions, uh, we've got a couple minutes now to address those. Um, and in the meantime, uh, while we're waiting to see if any questions come up, I, I just have a few final remarks that I can give as well. Uh, so let me just share my screen again here. All right, firstly, of course, I just want to uh, give special thanks to all of our presenters today, uh, Dr. Hart, Dr. Forge, Dr. Henderson, Dr. Lowry. I want to thank you for taking the time. I know it's a busy time of year for everybody in the, the grape and wine industry, academia not excluded. So thanks for, for being here and taking the time to uh, enlighten us on the work you've been doing so far. Uh, I also think it's important to mention we have a, a couple researchers under the crop protection and monitoring theme who have activities that um, we didn't have them do presentations today because they've done presentations for us in previous webinars. Uh, I'm thinking specifically about uh, Jose Herbas Torres and his work with grapevine trunk diseases uh, and Louise Nelson and Tanya Vogel working on crown gall. Um, they've done webinars for us um, previously, I think January and March respectively. So if you're curious to learn about some of their research that still fits within this theme, uh, they have video recordings up already from webinars they've done with us previously. So thank you to them. 
and thank you to the, the speakers we have with us here. Uh, just also to ensure that we can legally post this webinar recording to our website, uh, display the, uh, the attributions here for the Creative Commons license. Uh, want to mention, of course, as well, once again, that uh, these are not complete publications, any of the presentations you've seen today, rather meant to serve as an opportunity for the researchers to share the progress of their work to date. And it's, uh, it's owned solely by the, the authors and the presenters who have given us this information here today. Uh, and just a, a little plug for us again, we have one more webinar. We've done seven so far, including the one today in 2022, and we have one remaining coming up in exactly two weeks on June 23rd. This is another cluster update uh, webinar in that series. This one focused on the theme of optimizing the quality of Canadian wines. So if you're curious about that one, uh, definitely keep posted with us on social media, subscribe to our email newsletter, um, check for updates on our website as well if you want to be informed about uh, registration for that one. I, I believe it is active now, um, but if I've not posted about it yet on, on our website or on social media, I'll be doing so really soon. So you can stay tuned for, um, for the access for that. Mention once again as well that this webinar has been recorded and we'll be posting it on our YouTube channel and on our websites and social media platforms. So if you want to revisit it or send it to somebody who wasn't able to attend today, uh, you'll be able to do so within the next day or so here. Uh, Bill, have any uh, questions come through for our speakers here? Uh, no, no questions uh, just yet. We're good. Okay. Well, I, uh, perhaps that's a testament to the quality of the presentations we got. Everyone's presentations were so thorough that uh, nobody's left with any unanswered questions. So. Uh, I'll leave it at that. In the interest of time for everybody, I think we've hit exactly the two hour mark here. So that's perfect. Uh, once again, I'll just thank all of our speakers for, for being here, taking the time out of your day and sharing your knowledge and your, uh, your research with the industry. It's much appreciated. I'll let everybody go. Thank you so much for, for being here to watch this webinar and hopefully you'll be able to join us for our final one on June 23rd. So thank you so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Enjoy the rest of your day and We'll see you again soon. See you. See you.